Um, I'm going to now introduce Mark Fenton, who's going to give us a, a one-hour presentation, um, which includes Q&A, by the way, in discussion. Um, Mark is a national public health planning and transportation consultant. Um, he's also an adjunct um, associate professor at Tufts University, and he's the author of many books, including The Complete Guide to Walking for Health, Weight Loss, and Fitness. He's been a long-time and vocal advocate for non-motorized transportation. Um, and he also consults with communities. He's a frequent consultant on, on bike and pedestrian plans that fit into a community's comprehensive plan. And he is the, um, the former host of PBS's series, America's Walking. Welcome, Mark Fenton. So, this is my favorite day. I can't believe that it has become my favorite day. I didn't even realize it. First of all, I have a neighbor who's going to be the head of NASHTO, which is a really big deal if you're working in the transportation. But more importantly, you're, you're I'm, talk I'm in a place where the director of transportation, where the local mayor totally get this, where the people from the uh, Department of Transportation that I've worked with before, Bob Smith, where's Bob? He's back there somewhere. So I know he gets this stuff. Gee, it's obvious from the project that you guys are doing, you get it. I met the planning director today. And said, director? No, what's your title? No, Just no. plan. Yeah. Just but you get it in your planning department, clearly. Because most of the time, when I'm doing this work, I know I'm up against somebody. There's somebody who's hating this. Now, you may tell me, well, the downtown businesses have hated this project, or there are, there's always an adversary. There's some, or sometimes it's just the residents at large. We're frightened by the change. It's going to be different, and different is bad, and it's scary. But when you have this kind of a group together, having the kinds of conversation we've already had this afternoon, just starting, um, it's really good news. And, and you just said this, Michael, but I had been thinking it before you said, I often hold up Rhode Island as an example. I say, you know, the Rhode Island DOT is doing this. You know, they've got, they're adopting these kinds of guidelines as their standards and things like that. People say, but that's Rhode Island. They're tiny. They're the size of one of our counties. Well, I'll say, then do it in one of your counties first. Prove that it works and roll it out statewide. I do not accept that as an answer because it's really about a philosophical position. What do you believe? Do you believe those words you just said a few minutes ago? If you as a state, a community, a region, a town believe that, you can make that work at any scale. New York City's doing a lot of really amazing stuff. That's the most urban city in the you know, Western Hemisphere, perhaps, and they're doing it, right? Janet Sinek said it, Khan, their director of transportation, is an innovator on what many of us would call complete streets principles. So I, I just don't buy the argument, that, well, it's Rhode Island, they don't count. On the contrary, I see this as a national model. So know that I, who go all over the country talking about this stuff, talk about you guys all the time. In fact, I use some of the photos you'll see here today around the country. Um, uh, a, a special thanks, by the way, to the planning department. You guys were my host today when I was sort of downloading some local photos, giving me some more context. Um, this, was, uh, we were, this photo is from that visit uh, where the mayor was here with us we think 10 years ago, it had to be on the order of, right? 2012, 14, 13, somewhere in there. When we looked at the circularity, you guys were talking about what you were going to do with it. I'm going to talk about much more than that. Indeed, um, if you'll allow me, if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'm going to open with a couple minutes on why the health department's in this conversation and why, indeed, I think they, sh they really are helping drive the bus on this conversation nationally and should be. Okay? It's important context. I also, in doing that, want to give you all ammunition that is hard to push back on. Okay? It is hard to deny the health need, whatever your philosophical position on complete streets and transportation. So I'll do that. But then we have to ask the question, well, if we build it, will they come? If we build these nice bike trails and the bike lanes and all this silliness, are people going to actually get out there and use it? And I'm going to answer that definitively with an evidence-based argument that is yes. Okay, to be very clear, we have evidence. And in fact, again, I'll thank my public health colleagues because that's where you read a lot of this research. And then I'm even going to answer the question that I will sometimes get because this is the other pushback you'll sometimes get. This is all well and good, but Mark, we're a capitalist society. If this is what people want, wouldn't the market be directing us there? And I'm going to tell you that it is. That the market is saying this is exactly the style of community design that people want right now. And again, we have evidence. So I'm gonna, I'm, what I really want to do, I, you all get it. We're kind of the choir in this room. I hope that I'm adding arrows to your quiver. That's what I want to be doing, including the health arrow. And then let's talk about the example here, and I think some others. I've also worked, so you'll see photos from North and South Kingstown just because they are nearby, and they're also part of this initiative, and I have been fortunate enough to work there. So you'll see some photos mixed in, including, by the way, our very scary walk audit on, I think that's called <laughs> Devil's, what's the name? Devil's Foot Road. Road. Devil's Foot Road. <laughs> Might as well just be called Get Killed as a Pedestrian Road in uh, North Kingstown. <laughs> so let's start, though, the perspective with this little exercise, if you'll indulge me. Think back, please, to your earliest fond recollection of 
having been physically active as a youngster. And I really want you to play your memory tapes back as far as you can get. So think back to, some of you have done this with me before, please indulge me. Little kids, you're tiny, not high school sports. Get it in your head. If you have to close your eyes and actually envision yourself as a little kid being active. Got it? Everybody have an image? Turn to the person next to you and share those recollections right now. Ten seconds each. Go. <laughs> Okay. It would be far more interesting to have continue those conversations and to listen to me for the next 30 minutes, but indulge me if you will, because there's a method to my madness. There's a reason I had you do that. I want to ask you a series of questions about your recollections. I want you to raise your hand if your answer is affirmative regarding what you recall. So, for example, did you recall an activity in which you were only with kids of the same age and gender? Same age and gender, hands up. How many remembered an activity that occurred at a scheduled time and place? Scheduled time and place. How many uh, remember an activity that had to have an adult present to do it? How many remember an activity that required a uniform that you either bought or received as part of a uniform? No. How many had to have a, an umpire or a referee present to do the activity? How many remember activities where there were different kids of different ages and different genders? So it might have been boys and girls, older and younger, a mix. How many remember activities where there did not have to be an adult present necessarily? How many actually could not have gotten away with what they were doing if an adult had been present and tell the truth? A lot of you, right? Yeah, a lot of us have that. Sending fires out in the woods at your fort or whatever, damming up a neighborhood creek, right? How many had a wheeled vehicle as part of your recollection? A bike, a trike, a scooter, a skateboard that you had built. Something with wheels. Okay. How many remember water being part of your recollection? Um, a, a fish pond, uh, maybe a frozen pond, you're talking about ice rink, um, playing in the creek, okay. Ocean, clearly, the ocean state, I would hope, the ocean is some recollection. How many of you, if you'll allow me to use the term, remember being to some degree, when you were a little kid, a free-range kid? How many think, yeah, I was kind of a free-range kid? Not a rhetorical question here. Good. Now, last two questions are the order of the day, so listen closely. How many of you believe the majority of children growing up in America today are free-range kids? Be honest. Look around. Hmm. And last question. How many think it's good for the health of the next generation? That they're going to be healthier because they're not free-range kids. Good thing we don't have free-range kids anymore. Hands up for that. Wow. Think about what we just said. As recently as a generation or two ago, we had a lot of free-range kids. Most of us in this room. We don't anymore, and we all agree it's not good for them. To which I ask one thing and one thing only. What are you going to do about it? And it is not a rhetorical question. Anytime I stand before elected and appointed boards in particular, I have served, I served six years on the planning board and situate an elected board, I think the single question we should ask, if we don't ask any other, is what am I going to do about the fact that a generation or two ago we had free-range kids, we're not anymore, we know it's not good for them, what are we going to do about it? That's really at the heart of the conversation, and I'm going to make that argument. By the way, I'm not the only person talking about it. Far smarter people than I, a guy named Richard Louvre, wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods. He coined the term nature deficit disorder. He talks about all the physiological risks associated with being inactive as a youngster. By the way, he says urban kids, rural kids, all of them used to be free-range. Kids in the city, they had that lot in the neighborhood where they played the pickup game of, 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 of baseball or stickball in the street, right? Even in the most urban set, they were outdoors. Not anymore. Shane Gould, a child health advocate in Australia, she spoke up when I was at the Australian National Physical Activity Conference a couple years ago. She said, I don't think it's just a physical problem. She goes, what about the developmental challenges of kids not being outdoors? She says, where's the inventiveness and creativity of making up games? Where's the leadership skills of picking teams and being a captain? Where are the negotiation skills of dealing with it when there's no grown-up to tell you what to do when the ball goes out of it? In other words, you, as community leaders, probably started developing those skills when you were seven years old, right? Being a free-range kid. Kids today, they're in the U12 soccer program. There's a coach telling them when to start, when to finish. They were driven there and driven home from practice. They're in a very homogeneous group of kids, all boys, same age. They don't have to deal with difference, right? Think about it. I mean, it's a really dramatic change. By the way, quick side note, we have to acknowledge this. If you ask parents today, why don't you let your kid walk to school every day from grade four on like Mark Fenton did? Why can't he, your kid disappear on a Saturday morning on his bike with four friends and be told to be home when the dinner bell rings or when the street lights come on, right? I mean, literally, some of us had those kind of... You ask a parent why they don't do that, what's their first answer? It's not safe. 
There are horrible, scary men with big, thick mustaches hiding behind every tree. The mustache men are out there, right? And I don't make light. I mean, I understand. I'm a I have a 15-year-old daughter, 17-year-old son. I'm, I know there are places they shouldn't go unaccompanied. There are dangerous streets that they shouldn't have crossed at certain ages. I got all that. But you tell me, just so we make sure we're clear on the facts here, what's the actual increase in violent crime against kids by people who don't know them over the last 30 or 40 years? Let's take the time span when the percentage of kids walking and bicycling to school, walking and biking to school went from 40%, the green bar here now, 40% to only about 15%. And the percentage being driven to school by car, not by bus, by car, the red bar, went from 15% to almost 50. So that 30-year time span was the increase in violent crime against kids. By the way, one other interesting thing happened over that 30-year time span. Do you know what it is? <clears throat> Childhood obesity rates tripled. Childhood obesity rates tripled. As we've gotten the habit of throwing our kids into the backseat of the car for every trip, that's what we did to them. And the actual increase as a percent across the country is what? Anybody know the number? Increase in violent crime? Zero, zero, zero. Zero increase in violent crime against kids by people who don't know them. There are certainly more single family homes. There are more custodial battles. There are, there are things that have made the world a different place. More both parents working in the household, right? When Those, you say violent, what do you mean by violent? Abductions, you know, sort of. And I'm talking about people who don't know them. Let's make sure we're clear. Now, if you want to quibble about the data, you want to say, yeah, because there's no evidence. At the National Center for Safe Routes to School, we looked really hard at this. Because when we had, when we were trying to encourage people to walk to bike in school, we, we sort of, that was the first answer parents gave us. It's more dangerous out there. The reality is it's not different than when we were kids. In fact, the biggest difference with the roads, volume and speed of tr vehicles, size of vehicles, those are much greater differences. And indeed, if you want to talk about what a kid today faces as a real risk, the much higher probability than them being abducted. And I'm not making light. I'm not saying we shouldn't care about that. What I'm saying is we should fix that. If there's a place where a kid can't walk safely on the street because they're either danger from traffic or from crime, we should remedy it. Because what they face is one in three children born today will end up with type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. A disease that we used to call adult onset diabetes because we thought you could only get it in your 40s or 50s. We did not think physiologically you got it as a child. We're seeing it in eight and nine year olds. So they use the clinical term now, type 2 diabetes. So I'm not making light of real risks out there for kids. I'm saying our job is to fix it, not to throw our hands up in despair and, and sentence our kids. And by the way, let me add one other thing. I don't think we should even be talking about an obesity epidemic. That's the other, I think, flaw in the public health argument here. First, we forget how, how young it's reaching. Second, it's the wrong thing to talk about. We should talk about the two underlying behaviors that lead to ill health and which are independent risk factors and which, indeed, we can do something about what I call twin epidemics of physical inactivity and poor nutrition. Because here's what we know. If we can help a person be more physically active and eat a better diet, they'll live a longer, healthier life, even if weight does not change dramatically. So the problem with talking about weight is then we focus on the individual. You're a bad person, which is not helpful to the conversation at all. Let's instead focus on the behaviors that we collectively as a community can help change physical inactivity and poor nutrition. Questions on this part of the story? Because this is a kind of, the, the, I think, an important starting point of context. Good? Questions? Beth, go. Uh, so given that you have a whole generation of parents who have lots of anxieties about letting right. their children out of the house, mm -hmm. giving them more independence. Right. You're going to ask me, beyond, what, how do we fix that? Well, you know, beyond <laughs> physical, fixing the physical environment, yeah. we provide so, more... It'd be fair to say we can't talk about all of it tonight, right? right? Because we're talking about the physical environment and complete street. I do a lot of work, for example, as an example. Let me just give you a flavor. Okay. With Safe Routes to School, one of the examples we found very successful in launching what are called walking school buses, the idea of a designated route to school that an adult will walk accompanying a group of kids every day with a schedule. We did one in my neighborhood. My wife very successfully organized a walking school bus from my neighborhood to the Jenkins School in Situate. Now, the beauty of it was None of us ever saw, I never saw it as a long-term solution, nor did she. What we really were doing was helping parents bridge the behavioral gap back to a group of neighborhood kids walking with an adult, taking turns on a schedule. Then what happened is we got some sidewalks restriped, we got a mid-block crossing put in place where one was needed near the school with a crossing guard, so we made the environmental changes to painted some crossings and things like that. And drivers began to expect to see that group of kids walking. The group grew large enough, 
we started having older kids able to look out for younger kids, and we shifted back the social norm. And I think that the, this walking school bus was an example of the kind of sociocultural tool that I think goes with the built environment tools that we're talking about today. That's way too short an answer. We could do a two-day seminar just on what you asked. But is it a fair point to make that there are the environmental, physical environment, as well as the sociocultural environmental issues, and you can't ignore either? Fair? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I think it's the right question. But I will say this. Those behavioral things are never going to be a sufficient in intervention for success. We have plenty of reason to believe that alone won't change it, that we need the environmental changes too, or we will always throw our hands up in despair and throw the kid into the back seat of the car. Fair? Fair. Thank you. Good. It's a good question. I'm going to offer a biased perspective now. I'm only going to talk about the physical activity, not the nutrition side of this equation. It is A, more relevant to our conversation. B, I was a competitive athlete. I actually worked in this field for a long time. I, I actually did, I worked at the U.S. Olympic Training Center, I worked for Reebok's Human Performance Lab and Exercise Science, so I know a lot about exercise and physiology and human response. I did the weirdest event, by the way, in all of track and field, that's why I was at the Olympic Training Center. You tell me, what's the goofiest looking event in track and field? Steeplechase is second, and you're not going to that. But first is, yes, race walking, and here it is, photographic evidence that I was a race walker a very long time ago. And you know it was a long time ago because we only had black and white photography back then. And the other giveaway is that those shorts were in style back when I was competing, this being the 1928 national championship. Many people will ask why race walking, and it's obvious when I show you the next slide. Some of my good friends here have seen this before. It's, of course, the huge crowds that showed up at our conference. And this is, in fact, no kidding, now the start of the 1984 Olympic trials. 50 kilometer race walk. That's a 31 mile race. That's the LA Coliseum, Los Angeles hosted the 84 games, so they hosted the 84 trials. That's, it, they started us at 6 in the morning, like they do the marathon runners. What happens is you start on the track, you go do this loop around the city, then you come back and finish on the track. And when we finished, the stadium was packed, other events were going on, but at 6 a.m. when we started to avoid the hottest part of the day, you have to look very closely and you can't see my mom and dad. Right over there. <laughs> So I worked sort of with elite athletes and all that, and for a while we thought it was going to be about sport. Let's just come up with the sporting activity, the cycling class, you know, spinning, running, aerobics, right? That was. Um, but frankly, I can boil the public health challenge down on the physical activity side to three numbers: 30, 23, 65. 30. That's the minutes per day we're told every American adult should be physically active. Get about a half an hour a day. We know kids need more like an hour a day. These are minimum recommendations. The other thing we know, by the way, it does not have to be conscious exercise. There is growing and strongly growing evidence that if it's built into your day, so the person who walks 15 minutes to the bus stop in the morning and 15 back in the afternoon accumulates 30 minutes, they're at reduced risk for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, the list of diseases associated with sedentary lifestyles. So that's the good news. It doesn't have to be a structured exercise. Here's the bad news. At most, 20% of American adults actually get it. And the 20% is probably an overestimate because it's based on telephone survey data that the Centers for Disease Control collects. And what we know from that is people tend to tell you what they want to hear when they're on the phone with you. So, no, seriously, they do. They tend to say, oh, I exercised uh, five times last week. Yes, sir, I did. I'm also, they also are, tend to be taller and way less when you talk to them on the phone than when you actually measure those. 365, you would think, is what? It's yeah. near. Unfortunately, you have to add three zeros, and it is an estimate of the number of premature deaths every year attributable to physical inactivity and poor nutrition. The only thing that killed more of us in the 2000s, the early 2000s, was tobacco. And here's the scary thing. Tobacco deaths, as we have successfully started to reduce tobacco use in the country, are flattening, while inactivity and poor nutrition deaths continue to rise. So really, in the current look at this data, it's all, in all probability, it's the number one cause of premature death and uh, disability in our society now. Physical inactivity and poor nutrition. So that's kind of the, the scary context. And just to get back to this notion of sort of the socio kind of behavioral change approach, why don't we just encourage people to walk and bike more and kids to be outside more? Um, I think it's well illustrated by what I call the stickiness problem. So the last bit of public health data, and then we're out of this. But I think it's important context. Here's a nice little study done by a guy used to be at Brown University, he's now at the University of Pittsburgh's Medical Center, John Kingsley. And um, he, um, he was just trying to get people to walk 40 minutes a day in this study. And they had a six-month intervention where they called him on the phone and sent him email reminders and taught him how to warm up before they did their walk and stretch afterwards and select walking shoes. Kind of all the stuff we do in health promotion, right? Eliza, where's Eliza? I just saw her there a moment ago. 
So, so and you know, all the stuff we know works, right? They gave them T-shirts and water bottles because we'd love giving out T-shirts and water bottles if you turned in your exercise log, right? That's not the interesting question from a public health standpoint, is it? What happened over the six months that I'm calling you on the <coughs> The interesting question is, after I leave you to your own devices, do you continue to increase your exercise? Did it plateau or did it drop off? And here's the interesting thing. Even though at six months they measured statistically significant increases in aerobic fitness and decreases in weight, when you left people to their own devices and didn't call them on the phone anymore, didn't have t-shirts and water bottles, no more prizes, that's what happened to their actual physical activity rates. It actually dropped off. If I invert this curve, turn it upside down, I could show you exactly what happens when we do an enhanced police enforcement program on a road for speed, where we put police officers out there with radar guns, right? And as long as the cops are there, we see the speed go down. And everybody gets nervous, and, then the speed, and everybody changes their behavior, right? And then once the police aren't there writing tickets, really expensive tickets anymore, what happens to the speed on that roadway? Drifts back up. Unless we actually change the engineering on the roadway too, to mimic the change in behavior that we're trying to get through sociocultural or behavioral change. So my point is, you can't just do behavior change alone, it doesn't stick. Questions? That's, and, and I just, no, because this is a good, you asked the right question. Because I, for 20 years, thought that's what we were going to, all of us in public health thought we were going to just encourage Don't people. Teach them. No, teach oh, them, teach and they them. will come. Okay. Teach them, and they will come. Okay. Doesn't happen that way. Go. Any evidence about the speed cameras, you know, that could be there permanently? Yeah, we don't know yet because they're so new. There's some evidence that there's a, I've seen at least one study that says there's a lessening effect over time once it's not a surprise, you know, once people know it's there. But if that effect is we're writing fewer tickets, if we're writing fewer tickets but there's better speed adherence, then it's working, I would argue, right? So the drop off in actual infractions may be an indicator that you're getting people to adhere to the speed that you want, right? Right? So, so I think that. The jury's still out on that. But the bottom line is, enforcement alone that is only episodic clearly is not sufficient. Good? All right, so just to close the door on the public health piece of the puzzle, gyms, exercise programs, encouragement, t-shirts and water bottles, all stuff great, not nearly enough.